I'll read it again. It is from uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 19. The words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, one of the priests at Anathoth, in the territory of Benjamin. The word of the Lord came to him in the thirteenth year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, and through the reign of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah down to the fifth month of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, when the people of Jerusalem went into exile. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Ah, oh, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am only a child. But the Lord said to me, do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to, and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, You have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a boiling pot tilting away from the north, I answered. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I am about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshipping what their hands have made. Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, for I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. If you are a student or a teenager here, why not have a think for a moment about some teenagers who've been in the news in quite recent times? You might think, for example, of Greta Thunberg and her climate change campaigning. Or you might think of Joshua Wong in his early 20s now, but um, in his teens already a pro-democracy campaigner in Hong Kong and a Christian. So imagine yourself at that age, feeling the burden of this sort of purpose or mission. Someone has got to do this and it's you. You're the one set apart for this. Speaking to people and powers that often don't want to hear, don't want to change. Speaking about disaster to come, asking his people to swallow their pride, take the pill, turn back to God before it's too late. So here's Jeremiah, probably about 17 commentators think, given a mission like this. He's speaking first in the reign of King Josiah. Five years into Jeremiah's ministry, the book of the law will be rediscovered as the temple is renovated and Josiah will call for his country to get its heart right with God. But if we've read through the books of Kings and Chronicles, we'll know that while there were some godly kings of Israel and Judah, there's a vast majority of others who wouldn't be out of place at all in an episode of Game of Thrones. And so there's Jehoiakim, installed as a puppet king by the Egyptians who killed Josiah in battle after he's made his one big mistake by 
being involved in a war that he shouldn't have been involved in, but desperately changing sides when Egypt is conquered by Babylon. Jewish tradition describes his cruelty and sadism and sexual perversion and the book of Jeremiah later describes him murdering another prophet. And then there's Zedekiah, another puppet ruler who reversed the double agency, betraying Babylon to Egypt and causing himself and others to be carried off and executed. With all this, of course, comes religious compromise and following other gods. And so what Jehoiakim and Zedekiah do might well seem like a rational political response to the certainty of being captured by superpowers who gradually swallow up each other. But it's got to be remembered that it went against the warnings given by God through the prophets of the time, especially Jeremiah. We might compare it perhaps to Neville Chamberlain's uh, attempts to negotiate with Hitler if you've studied World War II at, at all, which seemed like a reasonable attempt to prevent another world war that nobody wanted. But in the end, historians judge, did nothing except buy Hitler time in the face of men and warnings from people like Churchill. So I remember seeing the, uh, the agreement that Hitler and Chamberlain signed in the Imperial War Museum in London. I love seeing historical stuff like that, but it's a testament to nothing. And so what these kings did in the end was to reverse the good work that Josiah had tried to do and take their nations further towards trusting in mere military strength and political gameplay and further from God's will and truth and protection. And so this is the time that Jeremiah is, is ministering in. A time when a nation that claims to follow God often just does so in name only. When a, a culture of liberalism can hide an intolerance of faith and difference. When so many of those who'd perhaps felt the touch of God on their lives and wanted to follow him with everything in them, maybe felt the pressure not to follow too much, not to try and live God's way, or to accept and say that any religion can lead to salvation. It doesn't matter what you believe. And so in other words, though we don't have the military challenges that Jeremiah had then, he did live in a time that's much like ours. A time that often seems to demand of us the same compromises. But when we know God's truth, that can't be a satisfying life, can it? Because we just end up playing games with God and with ourselves. And we lose faith under that pressure if we let it take our eyes off God. Let it take from us the joy of his kingdom and the truth that his ways are right from us. So Jeremiah challenges us to say, okay, culture is what it is, but God is still true. If we speak about Jesus, many will be hostile, some will listen, but whatever, God is still true. It's not easy swimming against the tide, but God is still true and he will help me and he will give me strength. In later chapters, and we're going to look at some of these promises in the next few weeks online, uh, about the things that Jesus will do for us, opening up to knowing God, turning our hearts of stone to flesh. And so he also challenges us with the great truth of God's promise of redemption, unfolding over centuries. And so opinions that might be different next week, a culture that might be different next week, a peer pressure that might be different next week, is what it is. But God's promise is faithful over centuries and forever. God is still true. And so in the midst of all this, young Jeremiah weighing up his calling. What's he going to do? 
In verse 6, he's clearly feeling overwhelmed. I'm just a child. Why me? I'm not eloquent. I can't do this. There's proper prophets around who look like Gandalf and everything. Send them, they might get listened to. But what he doesn't do is walk away. He's not going to let his response to God be defined by fear or unbelief. Because he knows that he needs to follow, not just for himself, but because of others who need to hear what he's got to say. Joshua Wong, campaigning for democracy in Hong Kong, felt this fear too, and he said this, I think Hong Kong's struggle for democracy is similar to David versus Goliath, but the struggle is not just about me. God's going to reassure this scared young prophet, just as he will also reassure us. And so in verse 5, God has spoken an amazing promise over Jeremiah's life. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, set you apart, ordained you a prophet. We aren't all called to be Jeremiah, but we have all been formed by God. You're not just a being formed by nothing more than random biology. You're handmade by God. The Puritan writer William Gurnall writes this, can you imagine the love that God has for a child that he has carried for so long in the womb of his eternal purpose? That's not just Jeremiah, it's not just those who are called to be John Wesley or Billy Graham. It's you and me. With loving and infinite care, God has made the stars, the planets, the galaxies and the oceans. And at the pinnacle of all that is us. And if we've heard and answered the call of Christ to each of us, we're not ancient Israelites, but we are still called to be set apart. Second Peter tells us this, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And so in verse 8, God tells Jeremiah, don't be afraid, I'm with you, I will rescue you. Jeremiah is going to undergo massive hardships, he's going to be thrown into sewers, he's going to be sent into exile, he's going to have everything under the sun done to him. And he isn't a superman, he will feel the frustration that we can often feel. In chapter 20, some of which we can see on the slide here, he's going to have to work through a huge spiritual depression, like all of us no doubt have to sometimes. He's going to accuse God of deceiving him, overpowering him, making him a laughingstock. What has following you brought me but being laughed at, being insulted, being bullied? He says, all my friends are just waiting for me to slip, watching for my failures, waiting for me to swear at school or at work so they can say, there's no truth in this. So he doesn't want to speak anymore. He curses the day of his birth. Imagine when it's your birthday thinking, happy birthday to me, wish I'd never been born. <laughs> but he knows the truth. And he clings on to it. And he says, it's a fire in my bones. I can't hold it in. And he doesn't just pray piously and politely. He gives his pain to God with complete honesty. And so he challenges us to do the same. He speaks God's promises in his prayer, calling on God to vindicate him. While also saying, that God examines the righteous 
laying his own heart open to be probed and operated on. And so slowly, God is able to heal him and his pain becomes a song of praise and trust once again. He also never loses the memory of God's touch on his life. Remember when you first knew that Jesus was real? In chapter 15, he talks about eating God's words like food when they came to him. In verse 9, God touches his lips and says, I've given you my words. I've equipped you. In Luke 12, Jesus makes his followers the same promise, that the Holy Spirit will help us, give us words, as well as the promises we have elsewhere, that the Spirit will help us know the truth and be assured about it. And if we look at verse 10, we can see God assuring Jeremiah that this isn't just doom and gloom, there's tearing down, but there's rebuilding, there's uprooting, but there's replanting. Jeremiah speaking hope as well as exile. When I was preparing this, I wasn't quite expecting that we'd be entering into another lockdown within a couple of days, but maybe as well as challenging us to keep our heads up and our faith through that, it challenges us a bit about also just not being condemning, but showing God's love in what we say too. But it's also a great promise that God fulfills his word that he brings us through times of hardship, that in a time of pandemic when so many of our material securities are again going to be stripped away, he'll renew us if we keep our hearts right with him. He's a God who keeps his promises, who watches over his word. And in verses 11 to 14, we can see two illustrations about so firstly, there's the almond branch. At first glance, it doesn't feel like much. Later in exile, when God calls Ezekiel, it's like all of heaven turns out for the occasion. There's throngs of angels, chariots with wheels of fire, and Jeremiah gets this bit of branch. But it's actually symbolising something really powerful because commentators and also naturalists tell us that almond is the first thing to bud in the spring, but the last to blossom. So unlike the instant fixes of our appetites or our desire to be delivered from adversity quickly, God's promises takes time, but he watches over his word and they will be fulfilled. Israel goes into exile, endures it before deliverance. All the promises that the prophets make about Jesus take centuries to be fulfilled, but fulfilled they are. God says here, he watches over his word. So what he promised us? Forgiveness, eternal life in him. Vindication in this life and in eternity. Promise to strengthen us by his spirit in everything we go through and he watches over his word. Our watch can be so transient and fragile, can't it? We say we're going to pray for something and we forget or we get distracted. The 16th century Christian poet John Donne describes distracted prayer like this. I throw myself down in my chamber and invite God and his angels into that room. But when they come, I neglect them. For the noise of a flower, the rattling of a coach, the whining of a door. In lockdown again, would we ask God to help us watch better? Would we keep faith that he's our God who watches over his word. And so next we get the boiling pot. If you've ever seen somebody badly scalded by boiling water or ever had it happen, you'll know that this is a horrible metaphor of God's judgment. One thing that criminals and gangsters sometimes do to each other is douse each other with boiling water that's been loaded with sugar so the effect of it clings to you for 
longer. In my professional capacity, I've seen the results of this once or twice, and it's not a sight that you easily forget. But unlike this rough judgment, God's judgment is never unjust. We've been doing Romans with our student group, and, and Romans chapter 1 tells us that God's wrath is poured out against what? Human sin and wickedness. But God has also promised to renew, to bring back. Another prophet, Hosea, says this, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he's torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He's injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. Do we need to return to the Lord? Do you perhaps need to come to God for the first time to say, Lord, our culture doesn't have all the answers, especially now. Show me your reality, your truth, your forgiveness. Help me to know you, to know that you're there and to follow you. And so if that's you, please don't leave without speaking to one of us, taking the gospel with our blessing, perhaps thinking about the discover course, exploring this great eternal promise further, because it's the only thing that is eternal. Because just as Jeremiah is urging his people to take God's discipline, to return to him, the promise of the gospel for you and for me is that Jesus has taken our punishment, taken our sin, our nagging sense that we're not quite whole, that things aren't as they should be, our turning away from God's truth. In Jesus, God has himself paid the penalty for all our wrongdoing. And so, God's last promise to Jeremiah here is that he's made him a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall, who will be fought against, but not overcome. Jeremiah's probably not feeling this at all, and most of the time, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably don't feel particularly strong either. But God says to him, it's been done. Not sometime in the future when Jeremiah's done enough hit classes or been on a few boot camps with Israeli special forces, but today. Some of God's promises to us will only be completely fulfilled in eternity. But God is still helping us now. Our risen Saviour intercedes for us in heaven. The Spirit of God lives within us. And so, at the beginning of this book and throughout it, Jeremiah challenges us to be strong in God. In a culture that opposes his word and his sole claim to truth. To come before him in honesty when we need to. To keep eating his words, his presence in our lives like Jeremiah does. And through Jeremiah, God also promises to strengthen and renew us. Our God, who was in covenant with Israel, is in covenant with us too. Through the blood of Jesus, the promises of redemption made by the prophets that Jesus will fulfil. And our God watches over his word.